started on my uh, talk this afternoon. Uh, this is on a personal project I'm working on at this point. Um, I've been calling it Pigeon Talk for reasons that I'll explain shortly. And I've been informed that Pigeon Talk is not a very good name for this project because um, I uh, got some feedback from uh, a person living in France who said that in France, the word pigeon means the target of a scam. And it was a very derogatory term. And so I've been told it would be an insult to the French people to call this pigeon talk. And I tend to agree that I shouldn't call it pigeon talk. So this is only my working title for now, and I will be changing it. But uh, as is, this is a personal project. Let me tell you where I'm coming from. I told you yesterday that when I was young, I was 15 years old, I built my own computer. And um, this is a version of the computer, probably four or five years later, it had eight kilobytes of RAM on it. I started with a quarter K of RAM. I usually win the contest for smallest RAM system of anyone who had a computer back then. Um, and what I found during that time was I was having so much fun doing interesting, wild, creative things with the computer. And I had this feeling that I could imagine something and make it happen. And it was just so cool to be able to do that. Um, one example, I had my computer programmed, or I programmed it so I could make little sound effects that sounded like R2-D2. And then I connected a microphone into a one-bit input port. It couldn't tell what I was saying, but it could tell that there's sound in the room. And I programmed it so that when the sound stopped for more than a quarter second, it would play the next sound effect in the list. So I would bring people into my room and I'd say, hi, R2, and it would go Oh yeah, how are you doing this morning? So um, I'm going to have to turn you off shortly. And people would be amazed that I'm talking to this computer. But it was just the kind of fun thing that I did at the time. I would like very much to be able to share that joy of being able to write software and make something that works and something that has some visual effect or some audio effect or something that uh, makes you feel like you've, you've accomplished something really cool. And I'd like to share that with kids who are new to computers, who haven't had the chance to experience that kind of joy, and sort of get them, get them hooked a little bit on computers and programming. I also mentioned yesterday that I wrote uh, a game called Sea Turtle Rescue. I had developed a small talk virtual machine that interpreted visual works bytecodes. The problem is that if I was to use that virtual machine to do anything for for kids to help them learn and experience this sort of programming joy, I couldn't really do it with a commercial version of Smalltalk. It's, the commercial versions have much different focuses and much different requirements. Uh, in order to download a, uh, a, a commercial version, you have to uh, sign effectively um, non-disclosure that you're not going to export um, parts of the system that have encryption in them and things like this. And that's a very reasonable concern for the commercial small talk vendors. For myself, I wanted to give this to a 10 year old, a 13 year old, without having someone else have to sign a legal license for them. And um, so I, I really wanted to have something smaller and easier to, um, to distribute. Um, I've been asked, why can't I just use Faro? For my purposes, that's actually a consideration, and I'm actually seriously talking about that. But let me tell you what I've done at least. I wanted to take that virtual machine and just disconnect it from visual work so I wasn't dependent on anything to do with a commercial uh, environment. So I re-implemented the VM with a whole brand new set of bytecodes. I designed my own bytecodes. I re-implemented the whole block mechanism. Um, and I wrote a recursive descent parser and a code generator. So now I have an actual 
small talk compiler that will generate a code that can run in that small talk. And the compiler itself runs in that small talk, so it can actually compile itself. It was pretty cool. From a personal point of view, that was um, something of a, a pilgrimage that I've been through everywhere else in small talk, but not really that part of the system of a compiler and a full virtual machine. And for me, it was satisfying to finish that trip. Um, so now I have a small talk that has no relationship to any commercial version. It has no code that comes from any commercial version. And I'm at a point where I've basically burned the bridges and said, I can't even go back to a commercial version. I have to move forward with the version that I have. Um, and I will be upfront about this and say this is a solution without necessarily a problem, but I'm just exploring. So we'll see where it goes. The virtual machine is tiny. These are the files for the virtual machine. Anyone who uh, is familiar with VMs for um, other uh, small talks will look at this. The biggest file here is 51 kilobytes for interpret.c and say, this is tiny. I showed this to Elliot Miranda and he says, it warms my, warms my heart that people are doing this kind of work, he said. Um, in order to develop a user interface, I wrote a WebSocket interface. There are two of them, actually. One is at the virtual machine level, so that at the VM level, I can put a flag into the image that says, start in debugging mode, and it immediately opens up WebSockets and allows me to connect in and do single steps and things like this in, you know, from, the, um, from the virtual machine. And then the second one is if you get past that, you don't stop in the VM, then the image itself comes up and opens a WebSocket. So I can connect to that and I can do things onto a browser interface from my, uh, my virtual machine. So let me give you a quick little demo of this. Here's my VM, uh, it's written in C. It actually runs on Windows, it runs on Linux, and it runs on Raspberry Pis, which are three platforms I've tried it on. Uh, I have to allow access for some silly reason. So now the VM is running. It's actually waiting for a connection. So I'm going to come in here and say, open up this HTML, and I'll open it with Chrome. And now I have um, a user interface connected by a socket to my VM. Uh, when I was running this on a Raspberry Pi, the VM was running on the Raspberry Pi. The browser was running on my Windows laptop. So it was sort of a remote debugging kind of thing. Three plus four, the mandatory first small talk expression comes up and you can see there's seven in the, um, in the field down below. That just shows you that Smalltalk is running. Uh, I can do simple things, five squared, print it. My development environment consists of Notepad to edit .st files, and then this where I can say, um, go to the st source folder and there's a file called allfiles.st as file name, file in. <laughs> and that's how I get the code into the system. This is actually recompiling all of the Smalltalk source for every class in Pigeon Talk Smalltalk. And uh, it's just rebuilding the whole image. It's rebuilding all, all of the compiled methods. It takes a minute to do it. It's a little bit slower on the Raspberry Pi, but it does work. And if I've only made changes to specific files, then I only have to file in those specific files. Um, I had to implement SHA-1 because uh, WebSockets actually use SHA-1 
um, uh, hashes to certify the web connection. So I, I had to be able to do that. So now I'm back, and there it says a file name, which is a result of that last expression, and I'm ready to go again. Um, this obviously is not a terribly good user interface. I would like to get something more. Down below, I have an HTML5 canvas, and you can see I've just coded JavaScript so that when I move my mouse around, it uh, sends an event down to um, the Smalltalk and says, here's a mouse move, and the Smalltalk just answers, yeah, I got a mouse move. So uh, the, the browser can send a web connection or send a web sockets message to the image anytime it wants. It doesn't wait for a response, but then the image can send a response back to the browser anytime it wants, and it doesn't have to wait for a response. Let me pull up a file here. Um, this is my JavaScript, and I have a comment at the top here, which is just a string. So I'm just going to copy that. Come in here, and um, I'll paste that in. Um, so all I'm saying here is return this string. And instead of saying print it, I'm going to say render. What that's doing is it will send the string down to Smalltalk. Smalltalk will say, OK, here's the string back. But then I'm going to render the string as, um, as JavaScript commands to do things. I'll just render it and then explain it after. There we go. So now I have some things down below that are two components that are overlapping. And on one of them, I have a red border that's a little bit thicker, has some text on it that's clipped to the border. I've drawn a polygon in blue. And then the other one, I have uh, just a simple blue curve. And that's, if you look at this, this is, those are all of the commands to do all of those drawings. My JavaScript accepts this JSON text, and it will execute these commands. So for instance, uh, an add component means add a new window or pane or rectangular region somewhere to my screen, and um, make it into, uh, or call it window one, um, no parameters, uh, and I'm going to position it at 30, 30, 200, 200. So that places one box on my screen. This places another box on my screen. The JavaScript will keep a map or a dictionary, if you wish, of the names of the components with the list of commands needed to refresh that component. So I'm saying, OK, for window one, here are the commands needed to refresh window one. And for window two, these are the commands needed to refresh window two. And then JavaScript will basically as a case statement, case of fill style, then it means take the four parameters and or the, the one parameter and use it as the fill style. For stroke style, take the one parameter, use it as a stroke style, and call the appropriate canvas methods on the on the canvas. This is very reminiscent of the lively kernel technique that um, uh, Dan Ingalls used for the lively kernel. And um, the only difference here is that now instead of programming in JavaScript, I'm now programming in Smalltalk. So I have this. Where do I want to go with this? My thoughts are I could actually build a little mini windowing system here with uh, windows with titles, with close buttons, with expand and collapse buttons, that wouldn't be too hard. And I could um, build up windows with panes, and each pane would be one of these components. And then for things like scroll bars, as I move the, as I click on a, on a um, scroll bar and move, those move events will be sent to the, the VM. The, the, or the Smalltalk image, the Smalltalk image would say, oh, update your screen to have this text so that it scrolled this way. And I would be able to scroll. And I should be able to get 
a relatively decent user interface out of it. Um, where to go from there? What I would love to do would be to create things that are frameworks for little projects that kids could work in, and then allow them to write code in this environment or something, something similar to play with those uh, environments and get something interesting working. Uh, one environment might be um, uh, a puppet a simulator where you have uh, a, a picture of a background that you design and then you have a puppet coming in on the left and a puppet coming in on the right and the first one shows a little text box that says knock knock and then the second one shows a text box that says who's there and they have a little joke back and forth. And then you can post that onto the internet and have people access it from the internet and be able to show your friends, here's my knock-knock joke and share it with people. Um, another example is something I call pin art. Pin art would be, um, I'm going to take a shape, let's say uh, an ellipse, and I'm going to drop pins every few, uh, few millimeters along the, uh, the ellipse. And those pins are all numbered, so they might be numbered 1 to 100. And then your job is to write code that says start at pin 0, or start at pin 1 if you want to have one based indexes, like Smalltalk has, and then draw a line to pin number 33. Then go to pin 2 and line uh, pin 34, and then pin 3 and pin 35, and draw interesting patterns inside the ellipse. Uh, have you uh, have the ability for you to, to define your own shapes and we'll put pins on for it and you can program your own um, filling of those shapes. Maybe the filling isn't with straight lines, maybe it's with polygons and you can change the colors of the polygons and come up with something interesting that you've programmed yourself in that framework. Um, I would love to be able to have frameworks for sound effects um, something as simple as um, count to 10 and then turn the sound on and then count to 5 and turn the sound off. Repeat that 200 times and see what it sounds like. And then be able to play it and hear that audio. Um, so these are the kinds of things I'm looking at. Some of these I can do right within uh, Faro if I wanted to use Faro and that's why I said earlier Faro actually satisfies a lot of these uh, requirements. Um, I'm also looking, though, at if we can push beyond Smalltalk and into, um, into something that is uh, not Smalltalk, but uh, um, something that's easier to understand what's going on and to be able to visualize the environment that's running. This is a video I made in Pavre for, um, for my thoughts of what might be possible. I don't know whether it is or not. I don't know whether it will be effective or not, but this is my idea. Here I have a program. Um, I'm going to pull down that uh, argument. Uh, now I'm going to send the message X and it comes back with the answer 8. Now I pull across X, send the message minus. That goes off, comes back with the answer five, and I assign that into the variable delta. And I graphically show where all the values come from, where they're going to. If there's a message sends, it flies off the screen and comes back. I was visualizing that message send being done by a pigeon, and I would actually have the icon of a pigeon flapping its wings and carrying the message away, and then coming back with a result. Um, so, this way uh, it would highlight the step that it's on and um, show you what it's doing. These could either be automatically running like this or more likely have you press a button to say step, step, step every time it does an operation. Here I'm zooming out and showing the flow of control. So now I'm returning, return, call this, call that, return, 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 call that, call that, call that, return, return, call this, call this, call this, return, call that, return, and all the way back. 
And I like the idea of being able to graphically see in an effectively an inspector that shows you the network of objects that's interacting and be able to see the flow of control as it goes through the system. And I think for many things that would be very helpful. Um, I don't know if it will get overwhelming. That's to be experimented with. But that's where I'm headed and this is why for this kind of environment, I would need to have something a little bit beyond small talk. If your programming is at the level of this, where you are dragging and dropping operations onto the screen, then why is it that we need to have a parser with, let's say, um, parentheses? The parentheses are implicit in the way these things are dropped in. Why would we need to have the distinction between unary, binary, and keyword messages? A binary message is just something that has a receiver to the left and an argument to the right. And when you define the minus, you could define it as saying a minus has a receiver to the left and an argument to the right. We don't need to have the syntactic notion of a unary message or a binary message or a keyword message in order to do this. They all just become simple message sends. And in fact, the placement of the receiver doesn't even have to be the first thing in the list. Um, if I wanted, I could have a message that, went, that said, if receiver, then, uh, then part, else, else part. And so it would have, it would be a, um, effectively a three keyword message, except that the message starts with the word if. And I explicitly say that after the if, that's where I'm going to put the receiver in. And I should be able to look that up the same way as I would with regular small talk messages and dispatch them. And the, the uh, developer never knows about um, colons at all. And to that extent, why can't variable names just be word, space, word, space, word? Instead of x delta, why can't I have x space delta? Um, if, you, if your programming is graphical, then you don't need the compiler to be able to identify uh, a word for you. And then finally, um, if I have uh, methods called if then else. Why can't I take those methods? That would correspond to some sort of symbol. Why can't I have translations of that symbol into other natural languages like French or Spanish or Japanese? And so that a program that I create that says, you know, this minus this and if this then that translates into French as uh, C condition, uh, then, you know, pui, that, whatever, and have it come up with the French words for people who are speaking French, which means that it's possible to translate a program automatically from English to French if people have put in appropriate translations for those words for those languages. And uh, I think it would be wonderful if people in English-speaking worlds or in English speaking regions can communicate, can, can publish code and have it picked up by people in Japan who read it in Japanese and can submit changes in Japanese and they're picked up by people in France speaking French. Uh, so these are some thoughts I'm tossing around. I don't have any answers to them, but if you get away from programming as text into programming as graphics, then it gives you much more leeway to get away from the compiler. And it, we're effectively programming the parse tree. And I'm interested in that. So that's basically my talk. That's where I am with it. I don't know where I'm going with it, but I'm along for the journey. So if anyone's interested in talking about this, I'd love to chat about it. But um, this is my little personal project for now, and we'll see where it goes. Questions? was easy. <laughs> Thank you.